So BioRaft is a platform, software as a service, multi-site application for scientific researchers, all built on Drupal. Um, we help with compliance and training and tracking of chemicals and radiological materials. We like to say we are helping to prevent the next zombie apocalypse because we are encouraging lab safety. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, if you see any of these postcards scattered about uh, here today and tomorrow, uh, grab one for your desk on the back, contact information to, uh, to learn more about us. I mentioned that I organized Drupal Nights. That is a once a month um, presentation at our offices in Cambridge. BioRaf sponsors it. It's our way to give back to the community. Presentations on all of the, uh, the different applications uh, and skill sets for web professionals. We also have a growing library of the videos. We record, we, we record every single one of them. So there's videos, slides, links, just tons of resources. So today I'm going to talk to you about a journey. Um, start with the problem. Like I said, I, I've been a developer for years, so I'm, I'm trying to learn how to be a really good project manager. So I see problems, I want to solve them. Uh, we have problems including technical debt, bugs, QA takes forever, just like every other organization out there. And in my research and my continuing education, I learned a couple things that will help us solve these problems. I learned about personas, user journeys, user stories, and finally, behavior-driven development and BHAT. First problem that I encountered um, is existing technical debt. Technical debt are, is things that you could fix now, but you don't fix now, and it comes back to bite you in the butt later on. Um, sometimes this happens because there's business pressure to release something very quickly. We need to get this out the door now. We'll come back later and take care of that. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it's because of lack of foresight. Uh, you didn't know that this feature needed to interact with another feature, and so you wrote the code in a way where it is not loosely coupled enough to extend it. Sometimes it's just there's no code documentation. It works perfectly well, but when you go back to it three years from now, you don't know what it actually does. So I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I accept the decisions that were made in the past. There were valid reasons for every single one of those decisions, but I don't have to add to this technical debt. So we're going to address the issues as we work on them. We work on a chunk of code that uh, lacks commenting, we add comments in that time around. It's a slow path, but we're working on it. We also made the decision to not make any new technical debt, and we're trying to write our code better, have more foresight into the future, and follow coding standards, and, and everything a good coder should do. But we still have bugs. Our code base is very, very complicated. It is very, very large. It was originally written in Drupal 4.6 and it has been growing and upgrading over the years into what it is today. Unfortunately, that means a small change in this section of the site can cause a problem in this section of the site, and you don't necessarily catch that right away until the client calls and says, is that supposed to happen? And you go, oh no, that wasn't supposed to happen. So no problem, we have a culture of, co of quality at our company, so we, we started doing peer code reviews, checking at everything that went out the door. Things are definitely improving we can make it even better. Not only are we looking at the tickets for uh, that sprint, making sure did the code actually solve the problem, did it break anything else, we're actually doing a full site of functional testing. We're going through all the verticals in the site. For us, going through the chemical section, the radiological section, the biological section. For your site, that could be the search, the blog, the photos. And we're going through all of this, making sure that everything works really well. And it's made a huge difference. But there's challenges with this approach. It's very repetitious. It takes a long time, and it's kind of inconsistent. You know, if I test the blog section, you know, one release, and Dan tests at the other release, were we following the same test path? Were we looking for the same things? Was one of us logged in as admin? So in my search to be a, you know, a better project manager, I did some continuing education. I took a one-day course on Agile and Scrum Fundamentals. I'm sure many of you here have taken a similar course. It was wonderful, by the way. Uh, I watched an Atlassian webinar about doing Agile right. And then I also attended my own Drupal nights where I learned about BHAT. So there are these four elements that within a relatively short amount of time, I started learning about. 
And then I had my light bulb moment. They're all actually related. This code thing about BHAT and what I'm trying to do as a project manager are all part of the same path. Like I said, we already have a culture of quality at our company with our code reviews, our manual QA testing. We even have automated data validity tests running at midnight every night just to make sure everything is, is working as we want it to. But if I take that and, and just kind of switch my perspective a little bit and focus on, well, what's the business value in a particular thing I'm testing? If I'm testing the search on my site, not that big of a deal. We don't actually have many people using our search because of the way our application is. But on your site, if the search breaks, that's a really big deal. So I started thinking, well, let's, talk, let's put that at the, the forefront. And how do I get there? The other uh, issues I wanted to address was the types of users that we need to masquerade as or pretend to be when we are testing. You guys have all heard. Never test as admin, because admin has permission to do everything. So you're never going to actually get the experience of your content editor or your uh, number one commenter on your site. Additionally, I wanted to make sure our, our, our test coverage was consistent. And that means I need to figure out what, what that test path should be. Lastly, I want to repeat it every single month and not have it take eight hours you know, per person to do that. Solution, based on everything I learned in my continuing education, I'm going to start writing personas. And this is going to be a persona for that content editor, for that super admin, for the paid member, or just the donor. I'm going to write for each of those a journey. What do they most frequently do on the site? What is their actual path? And for each step in that journey, we can break that down into a user story. How many of you guys write user stories now when you're planning? So you're, you're almost all the way there to, to behavioral development. Um, after I figure out the user story, like, I'm just going to switch the syntax into a B hat syntax, and I'm going to run it. And I'm going to prove that I didn't break anything this time around. User personas. These are fictitious characters that represent each different type of person that visits your site. I named a few, a paid member versus an anonymous member versus your content creators. The purpose of a persona is not to describe the tendencies of a group, but to instead to describe the behaviors of a specific person who represents a group. When thinking about your personas, you need to define your segments. This is kind of the, the types of groups of people that visit your site. Um, do you have volunteers? Do you have people that are email subscribers? Is there a difference between anonymous versus authenticated, not logged in versus logged in? Um, maybe paid members see different things on your site as well. You can even go as far to define your demographic, but this is not so important because it may not actually matter if it's a guy coming to your site or a girl coming to your site. And so if that doesn't matter, then you don't need to include all of those, that information in there. Articulate their values and their beliefs. If someone has interesting personality quirks, um, political persuasions, or even some intriguing hobbies, they might behave on your site slightly differently. They might dive into a section more than other people. You need to get into their skin. What are their day-to-day -day worries that might actually affect whether they're commenting or not? If they're worried that people are going to see their full name printed on a comment, they may not leave one. Things to think about. Define what value they get from your organization. It's important to understand why a user comes to your website and interacts with it. Once you understand that, then you can deliver more to them. Also, roles they have. This is really the, the Drupal roles. Um, like I mentioned before, different kinds of super users and content creators or moderators. As kind of the precursor to getting ready for your user journeys, you also should list the tasks that they commonly do. Um, messing with their profile, filling out quizzes, uploading photos. I mentioned I, I got this idea from a, an Atlassian webinar. Here's a screenshot of Emma the Eager from their video, which the link is in the resources section if you guys want to watch it. Emma the Eager, she's got a great tagline here, and it says, I want to learn as much as I can about everything. So that shows a lot about her personality. Because this is for Atlassian, 
um, they list, list some very specific things just for their site that may not work for yours, like what programming languages she knows. So you guys need to think about what your application is for this. What are the unique things you want to know about your users and start defining and writing down? So we, we created Roger. We're really proud of Roger. He is um, one of our super users. He's an environmental health and safety um, director or officer. We put together um, all this information that I mentioned before. I'm going to go through each of these one by one. Tagline, very important. I want to be a resource to the researchers, not the safety police. As I mentioned before, Emma the Eager wants to learn everything she possibly can learn. She's got a tagline too. But this is the one sentence that in a nutshell describes who they are and how they interact with your site. We have their position. For us, this is actually their, their job title in real life, not on the website, but there's a very similar correlation. And character traits. Intelligent, enthusiastic, bold, persevering, and an achiever. The way someone with those traits interacts with your site is very different than someone who is shy or paranoid. They, like I said, the person that doesn't want to leave a comment, things like that. So the, understanding these character traits is important. Roger has a, a role in BioRaft as well, as far as describing his duties. Um, he manages the department, he oversees all kinds of compliance activities, he schedules inspections for other inspectors to carry out, he even inspects laboratories himself. As I mentioned, getting ready for the user journeys is figuring out some of the tasks that your persona completes uh, in your website. Roger will be viewing dashboards and inspection logs. He'll be scheduling them, monitoring registrations, and overseeing life safety. Wow, that sounds like a big responsibility. And we take, uh, can even include with that what uh, we call job activities at BioRaft. These are more like permissions um, in Drupal, but he can go and edit information about groups, that metadata. He can view uh, institutional information about chemicals and edit those as well. So as we're putting all this together, we can see what he has permission to do, what he has to do because it's his job, and his demeanor while he's going through this because he's, he's an achiever. One of the other important parts to personas is kind of this varying scale, because not everything is black and white and can be in a bulleted list. Um, we try to figure out what an individual's technological expertise is. So that's technology in general. When they go to pay their parking ticket online, can they figure it out? Uh, do they use a Facebook account well? Things like that. And that is different than what's their expertise within BioRaft. In our case, Roger, yeah, not so great on the web, but man, does he know BioRaft. He is in there every single day, and he's made it his mission to master every task he has to do. So we take all of these elements and put them together, and we have a user persona card. If you guys remember Emma the Eager from the Atlassian webinar, for them, personas are so important, they're lining the hallways as you walk through the offices. They're even in a bathroom. So once we figure out how to wear our users' hats, we need to start walking in their shoes. We're gonna start with Roger and say, what's a goal he has on the website? He needs to schedule inspections. And we're gonna plot all these actions to uh, complete this goal. Everything, every page he needs to go to um, from a high level and then we can dive in deeper. Uh, another interesting thing you can do with the journeys is mark the level of frustration for each of those tasks and that will give you some more insight about your, uh, where you should focus your energies in your development. I'll go more into that a little bit. So um, use your journeys. Say you've got 10 personas and 10 journeys that you've decided are most important, so wow, that's a lot now. Uh, but you can aggregate all of this data together and take a look at it. What pages get hit most frequently in my site? You can compare that to your Google Analytics, kind of see if you're correct. What actions happen often? Um, emails sending out, digest emails versus immediate notification emails. And then which tasks were determined as challenging? 
Once you have all that information, you can prioritize actually some of your development. This section of the site is wildly popular. We should totally work on it. Or this section of the site is considered a pain point for 50% of our users. Maybe we should address some of those issues. Now you're probably wondering, how do we figure out this level of frustration or, or pain points? Um, you do have data out there um, from your, your support. If you've got email, people emailing the website, say, hey, I can't log in, or this and that. Um, if you actually have a phone line for a bigger application where people are calling in, you can figure out what tasks are challenging. Interview uh, those members of your team. This is Emma the Eager's journey. Um, she takes a very long and winding road. User journeys can be of any shape and, and color and length. I actually found a Pinterest page that has a lot of user journeys on it. And as you can see, some of these are, are beautiful infographics, and some of them look like they're hand sketched on a napkin. Um, as long as you get the data out there, it doesn't matter you know, how many pretty icons you have. So Roger's got a journey, too. Uh, his journey is to ensure that a lab will be inspected by a specific date. This is a pretty easy journey, four steps. He needs to enter the system, determine the lab, the date, the inspector, go ahead and add the inspection, and then confirm that he did it. Not very specific, um, but we can break that down a little bit further. Um, one of the reasons we chose to break down a specific area is because it's marked as red. So we need to figure out why is that considered red. And we probably know it's red because Roger called us and, and explained you know, challenges that he was having going through here. For Roger, interestingly enough, it's not that that task is that hard. He's got two ways to do it, and he doesn't know which one's best. So we broke this down. We didn't spend the time detailing actually the other steps because those had a level of frustration to zero. And the business value was, well, I don't need to worry about that just yet. I'm going to only break down the ones that are hard. And that's how you prioritize working on this. So for the first step, uh, he, I can't see, I think I need glasses. Um, he um, clicks on the, uh, the inspections. He goes into the queue to see everything that's queued up and double checks the lab that he wants to inspect. Is it already queued up or not? And so, well, yeah, it, everything looks smooth. That little subset of um, the second step, you know, there's a yellow in there. Well, that, that's probably not that big of an issue. But when he tries it the other way, he, uh, he actually has problems. If he goes to look at all the laboratories and then finds the lab and then scrolls down to the bottom to see the little thing that says, this lab's scheduled, well, that's where he's got issues. That's the challenging thing here. And so now we figured out, well, since this is the hardest thing, maybe our company should really work on maybe finding, uh, bringing that link up or having more training and guidance to use the other method. When you're thinking about your user journeys, you actually can separate into different kind of vertical segments for your steps. First part would be you know, discovery and pre-engagement. That includes logging in, if that's an important step. Um, investigation would be about going to that listing page of laboratories and setting things up. As soon as you find the laboratory, the action is yes, clicking, schedule, putting the date in, putting the inspector, and completion is, is confirmation. I find it much easier to think of these verticals and put them all together. Whether they display or not on your journeys is obviously up to you. I want to talk a little bit about that level of frustration again. Um, I had a scale of five, but basically it's you know, happy, sad, neutral. And as I said before, you know, paying attention to support requests, interview real users. If you work for a college or a university, walk outside and start talking to some people and find out what they like or what they find challenging with your website. And remember, you are a user too. Interview yourself. When you go through that website, if you find an area particularly challenging, you know, make a note of that. So once we figured out these steps in the journey, um, we can start kind of breaking those out into user stories. A user story is a description of a feature from the perspective of the, of the person who will be using it. And the value really comes from putting that user's experience first. It's not the admin's experience, it's Roger's experience. And it really helps you understand why you are building a particular feature. I have heard about you know, developers thinking that adding new graphs or displays to the website was a really, really good idea and went through and tried build, you know, built it and it was awesome. But the user actually didn't need that at all. 
So if when you're putting tasks together, you ask why am I building this and you can't answer that, it's not a very high priority. You still can build it, but it should be lower on your list. User stories have a format. As type of user, I want some goal, so that some reason. I know a lot of you use user stories, so you're very familiar with this. Um, it's important to always follow this pattern, and this repetition of this pattern becomes very important in BHAT as well. As an EHS director, environmental health and safety, I want to check the inspection schedule for tomorrow so that I know what to expect. It's pretty simple. I bolded the parts of there, you know, as a type of user, that's an EHS director, and in our case, that's actually a role in BioRaft and in Drupal. Um, I want to check the inspection schedule for tomorrow. My goal is figuring out the, the schedule, and my reason for doing this is so I just, I know what to expect, I know what my day looks like. As an EHS director, I want to schedule an inspection so that the inspectors know what their tasks are. As an EHS director, I want to schedule inspection so that the lab managers are prepared for their inspections. So for this combination of user stories, the who, the what are the same, but the why are different. And that's actually important to note in many cases because it's all about that user's experience. We can look at some non-BioRaft examples as a member, I want to upload photos so that I can share photos with others. As an administrator, I want to approve, photo, approve the photos before they're posted so I can make sure that they are appropriate. So there's one kind of feature set in your website is the uploading of photos and having them displayed, but there's two different kinds of users involved in these user stories. We can add the third one is as a you know, profile viewer, I want to make sure I can see you know, my friend's photos. We've done a lot of work thus far. We made 10 personas. We made 10 journeys for each of those personas. And now uh, we've broken all those out into user stories. How do I now use that to make sure I'm reducing my technical debt, not creating new bugs, and saving time on uh, manual QA? Enter behavior-driven development. This is a specialized version of test-driven development, and it focuses on uh, behavioral specifications of software units. So usually when people talk about testing, or maybe 10 years ago, it was like unit testing. If I pass an array into this function, I'm supposed to get a string of five characters. And the test says, uh-oh, your string with six characters, it fails. But it has no relation of what's going on in the application. You're purely testing the function, making sure that you've got sanity checks. With behavior-driven development, no one cares about the code. It could be written in any language. It's more of a, when I go to this website and I hit upload, I should see my picture right here. That's the behavior-driven development part. So the first thing you do is you, you write the test. You write the test before you write a lick of code. And that test is very similar to a user story. So you define the test. You then write your code to upload the photos. And then you run your test suite to make sure that it works. An important thing about behavior-driven development is it really encourages a relationship between the planning team and the developers. They need to really collaborate together to work on these tests because the user story is coming from the, the project management side and then the tests be, uh, start getting written by the development side usually. And they need to be in line. You need to communicate together. And there is that direct correlation between the user story itself and the test, so it really encourages that. As you recall, user story, as type of user, I want some goal, so that some reason. As a member, I want to upload photos so that I can share photos with others. Given initial context, when event occurs, then some outcome. Given that I'm logged in as a member, when I'm on my profile page, I should see a link to upload photos. I'll go over that one more time. The syntax for a user story talks about who, what, 
and why. Syntax for a BDD scenario is given some context, which is often given I'm logged in as Roger and I'm on the contact page. When I click a button, then some outcome. So you've already started putting the pieces together with your user stories to translate directly into these BDD tests. When you start putting all of this together, you can separate it into files. They're called feature files. Um, you can put all of your tests for testing your search in one file, for testing your blog in one file, and photos in another file. And this is purely organizational um, to help you understand where, where you need to go to start editing things like this. And in that file itself, you're going to list out scenarios. So my scenario is uh, making sure that when I, I submit a form, it gets submitted. And then you put out all the test steps in order to get there. What's really cool, and I love about this with BHAT, is that you can tag these scenarios. We're all familiar with tagging. It helps you find things easier. So if I have all my blog ones, I can tag them with blog. And if it's the blog that's testing for the authenticated user, I can add that tag in there versus the blog test for the anonymous user. That would be a separate test. And you can run only the scenarios that you want. Imagine you actually wrote all these tests for the, the 10 personas times the 10 journeys times I don't know how many user stories. Well, that'd be a really big test suite. So you can run the scenarios that you want at the time that you want it. Another great thing is you can automate this. So every night at midnight, it runs through absolutely everything and spits out a report for you. Um, if you are the one testing and write, like writing tests and you're actually testing your test code, uh, you can tag it with, you know, at test. And so you can just run that one until you get it just right. So BDD is actually this kind of big umbrella that's a subset of test-driven development. But I want to talk to you about BHAT. BHAT's just a tool. It's a way to implement behavior-driven development. And it lets you write these human-readable stories that describe behaviors on your site and users going through those behaviors. Um, and it also can be automatically run either when you hit go or when a, a script tells it to go. Feature files, those are the ones I mentioned, you know, one for search, one for blog, one for your photos, uh, are pretty simple. They're just text files. Uh, at the top of it, you say, well, what's the name of this feature? It's the events feature. And in this example, this is actually the Drupal Knights website. So they used to be called events, but now they're not called events. But um, so for the Drupal Knights website, in order to find events as a website user, I need to be able to see them displayed. It's pretty simple. Uh, you don't know if you can actually tell, but there's some grayed out text, a little lighter with the hashtag. That's just a comment. You are allowed to put comments in here to help explain things more. It is not necessary. It gets completely ignored by the interpretation code. So I added this in, describing what, what's below. Uh, so I've tagged this scenario with Drupal Nights and events, and I've labeled the scenario. So we've got the feature file, and it describes all the scenarios in the file. And then for the scenario, I said, see the next Drupal Nights event. I wrote my first test. Given I am on, that's the home page, then I should see the upcoming Drupal Nights block in sidebar A region. That seems pretty simple. You guys could all write that. Why the quotations around the upcoming Drupal Nights and sidebar A? That's an excellent question. I was going to get to it, but I'll, I'll skip ahead. So with this one, um, you see quotes around the single slash, which I said indicated the home page and then around the region, and also what appears to be the block title. Those represent variables being passed in to some backend code. So with um, these tests, you get to reuse things, because there's gonna be a lot of times you wanna test that a block is in a region, but it might be a different block and it might be in a different region. And with BHAT, as I will show in a minute, there's backend code that interprets all of this that a developer will need to, to help you with and to write but you can reuse each of these individual tests and just pass in different variables. So another example uh, is my feature contact. And in order to submit feedback um, as a website user, I need to be able to fill out the contact form. 
with this one, you can see, as said, given that I'm on the contact page, and I fill in some text, or sorry, I fill in some field with some text, and I go through every single field. So that's the label of the field it looks for, and it actually will add this in. A funny story, I was preparing this presentation um, for DrupalCon Austin, and I'm testing, and I'm hitting submit over and over again, and I actually have an entire local version of Drupal 9's website on my system, not really thinking about it, and all of a sudden I check my email, and I've got 30 emails. So the contact form actually is submitting, and because I had the email address to you know, our whole company, um, everyone knew I was testing and doing a really good job. So that's something that's really important to realize, that that's real. That's actually running as if it was someone clicking on your site. It doesn't have a personality, but it's actually very, very real. So I mentioned reusing code snippets. So to fill out a field, uh, a form field, you use the exact same syntax and you just replace the variables going forward. Um, and I press send message, that is the label on the button. So any button you wanna press in your site, you can say, and I press, whatever that label is. The last thing it says, um, then I should see message field is required. That's probably some of the simplest test right there is then I should see, it doesn't tell you where, what color, um, anything like that. And that's obviously the DSM that pops up in red on your screen. So I could be more specific, because it also uh, can go through the DOM and see that it's tagged as dot status dot error or something like that. Here's another example where my message actually gets sent. I fill out absolutely every single field and I'm testing to make sure that works as well. So we've got some backend code. Those lines that we keep reusing, something has to interpret them. Here's a snippet that I was working on. Um, it's PHP, and so it can be challenging to work with compared to the, the human readable text we were just looking at. Interestingly enough, because BHAT has been adopted so wonderfully from the Drupal community, is people have started submitting in different modules a lot of the files for these feature context.php. So a lot of the code's available. Because if you think about it, a Drupal site is a Drupal site. You log in and things happen. Um, we have regions, we have um, status messages. All of that's true no matter what you've done to your Drupal site. So there's a lot of basic things in there. If you want to test something very specific for your use case, um, then you're, you're going to have to work with your development team as well. This is very interesting too. If you look at the title of this piece of code, if I fill out every field with random text. In my previous scenarios, I was writing down every single field on that page and saying what the text needed to be and, and running it through. And I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I don't really care if we add another form field on here or remove a form field. I just want to make sure that when this one particular one is empty because I know it's required, that it fails to send. So I was like, great, I'm going to change this. So now I can run a test that says, when I fill out every single form field and then I change a form field to null, uh, I expect to see a message. So there's a lot of things you can do to, to make your lives easier. Um, and it's important to recognize you know, what, what is important to your development team and the functioning of your website. For me, filling out, knowing what every form field was, was not important. I just wanted to make sure that when it shouldn't submit, it didn't submit. So this is a lot of great code, right? You wanna see some tests? It's command line, right? Not that exciting. Um, if you look at the very, very top line, uh, the command I'm running to make this happen is bin slash bhat. That's it. And it goes through every single test I have written. And that's really awesome because the screen goes with all this like feedback messages. I mean, you get to see real time, you know, what it's, what it's testing and whether it's passing or failing. I mentioned before that for every single um, uh, scenario, you can tag them. So in this case, I decide I don't want to run every single <laughs> test. I only wanted to run the ones that were actually tagged with test because that's the one I was currently working on and making sure I was doing correctly. So when you run a test or a suite of tests, uh, it will actually display your feature. So you've got this great printout now of what's going on. Uh, you know where you are in your file and traversing it. So my feature text is there. Then it tells me what the tags are, a nice little cyan color, as well as the scenario description. 
And then it starts to running through things. The first thing it lets you know is what the file name is and what line you're on. So if you've got a problem, you know where to find it. And then it starts uh, highlighting the test in whatever color applies to the situation. In this case, it's green because they passed. So every single test that passes will be written there and be green. So that's really exciting. I did a great job. At the very end, it compiles a little bit of metadata about what it just did. It tells you how many scenarios they are, there were. Scenarios is that, that grouping that we just wrote, like a, much like a user story. And then how many steps were in there. And within that, what passed and what failed. Here's another example. The file's cut off, but there were two more scenarios that were running. And then I get to this one here. And I get green, 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 green. It's awesome. Yellow. What the heck is yellow? Cyan. Why is that another color, too? So it turns out I don't have any interpretation code that knows how to test, and I dance a jig. So it throws an error, and says, like, I, I can't do that. It's not that it failed. I don't even know what it means. So it actually just skips it because it's undefined. I'm sorry. It skips it because it's undefined, and then the subsequent test, it marks as skipped as well. Because if that previous one that they didn't understand was setting up for the following one, it can't correctly continue the test. So if you are the, the person writing all these wonderful tests and you're faster than your developer to write the back end code, you get a little notification. And it doesn't mean that you need to slow down because at the very bottom, you can see a little bit of PHP in yellow. That is a snippet of code. It's a placeholder for you to put that in your PHP file and now it understands that there's a test. Now it's not doing anything, it's just saying placeholder. <laughs> but it can continue moving forward. So you really need to work in conjunction you know, with your developers um, getting the, the BHAT test, the human readable test, and the PHP code going together. I know we mentioned you know, close to 1,000 user stories I think we've written in the last hour. How, how do you know? How do you do that? Where do you start? Obviously, if it's a brand new project, you, you start at the beginning. That's pretty easy. But Firehouse been around since Drupal 4.6. Where do we start? And that's where we start thinking about business value. What features on your site are the most important to your users? Not necessarily to you, but to your users. I mentioned before that if users on my site can't search, yeah, not that big of a deal. Ask Google how they think about that. That's pretty high value. That's the first test they should write. Users on our site, they don't have pretty profile pictures. They don't have any pictures at all. There's some buildings that have pictures. So you can't upload a photo? No big deal. Ask Flickr how they feel about that. It is so important to recognize what your users need to accomplish on your website. And that's where you start your journey into filling out all of these. Couple examples. Registering, logging in, customizing your profile. That's not important to me, but is it important to you guys? Maybe. Um, uploading photos, rating content, searching for content. One of the biggest bonuses that I learned when I started researching BHAT and playing with it is actually website platform agnostic completely. So there is a YAML file, which is purely a text configuration file, and you put in a couple things of information. And one of them is, is what website do you want to test? What's the URL? And so when I was running this, I put the alias to my local host, because that's what I wanted to test. Little did I know it still sent emails to the company. And then at one point, I actually tested Wikipedia. And it went there and went through all the steps to see how things worked. So it doesn't matter where, where this lives. I can test any site from my laptop. We, uh, your team might decide to you know, put it on a company server, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, I did have someone help me install BHAT. It took five minutes. Um, I literally have a folder on my desktop that says BHAT. Like, it's not even anywhere special. <laughs> so that's really cool. Um, we're really excited about that because you know, we've been around since Drupal 4.6. We're going to be around until Drupal 20. So it'd be really nice if we can reuse these tests and don't have to start over every time we upgrade. There's a couple things I want you guys to take away from this presentation. First, users are the most important part of your website. Without them, why do you have a website? 
You really need to put their needs first and you need to take the time to understand who they are. There are a lot of presentations out there. There is one tomorrow about researching your users uh, that I highly recommend, but it's so important to figure out who they are. Put their needs first. The process of understanding them is creating the personas. It's one thing to say, hey, yeah, I get it. I mean, I always knew who Roger was, but I really know Roger now that I have a piece of paper that explains it, and I took the time to fill out you know, the questionnaire figuring out who he is. Also, where are these people going on your site? I mean, we did say there's different segments of users that use potentially different parts of your application. And those can be down, broken down into the stories. And finally, we can turn those into automated tests. You guys are already taking the time to do agile best practices. Um, and behavior-driven development is just kind of the next step. And what I love most about that is how it really encourages the developers and the planners to work together. I, I've seen too often at many companies that the orders come down and then developers work in a silo. But when you're working together to figure out um, the specifications and even discussing priorities together, I think it makes it a world of difference. So just to recap, Existing technical debt keeps me up at night, but I found a way to make this better by testing our application. And what's even greater is that we've already started some of these things not knowing that BHAT was where we were going. We already started doing user personas. That's even, user personas are even used in our sales process, which is really funny because we were working on them independently. It's like, wow, this is great. Now we even have even more personas. Um, <coughs> Journeys, I think I know what Roger does, but until I actually write out that test path and realize that there's two ways for him to accomplish his goals, and one of them's not that great, maybe we should fix that. Um, if I wouldn't have taken that time, I wouldn't have known that, and I wouldn't have known I needed to write a user story about what his goal was so that I could write a test to make sure that we don't break the correct way. So take the deliverables from best practices in your respective fields, um, project management, usability studies, and use them as your fodder, your starting point to start doing behavioral testing. So once again, it's a circle right here. They all feed into one another from personas to journeys to stories to de behavioral testing. And it makes your life so much easier because you have less technical debt, less bugs. And QA is just a breeze then. You just hit a button. I did a lot of research for this. Um, I could have had five pages of resources probably. I shortened these for display, but, but those are all actually links. Um, the link to the Atlassian um, webinar is in here, and that was wonderful. Uh, also link to Drupal Knight's presentation on BHAT. That's a technical presentation of what BHAT is, not the journey to getting uh, your organization to using it. Um, that also was really amazing as well. So I will be uploading these slides to drupalnights.org. Just click on the library section um, and it'll be up there tomorrow probably. Any questions? Yes. Like normally you would have a browser, user using a browser. How does that happen? Sure, it's called a headless browser. Um, remember that YAML file I mentioned, the configuration file where you could put some specifications in? One of them is, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's either Goot or Gout, um, runs it right in the command line as if it were a browser. But I also can change that variable to say, I want to run this via Selenium 2. And when that happens, Firefox pops open and you see everything happening. So you either can watch it in the command line where it streams and scrolls everything, or you can um, actually watch things being clicked. Uh, I was having major challenges running it via command line when I had JavaScript things going on. But when you're in Firefox, it, it understands what's, it sees what you see, basically. Yes? So rather than just testing the functionality of the workflow, is there a way to test the UI? You know, certain UI interactions, things that respond to cursor movement or any other type of interaction on the page? I have not done that. However, you have complete access to the DOM. So you could find a way to do that. Another thing, the question I always get actually is, well, for our 
institution, you know, the problem always is is some CSS float drop happens. Uh, how do I ensure by not accidentally having a field text too long that that doesn't happen? And so you can um, integrate with Sauce Labs for screenshots, and it can compare things for you. So you actually can even test things like that. I have not done it though. Yes. Oh, the pressure. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I have a couple things I would need to do to set that up, but after this presentation, if you, anyone wants to sit around me, I will do it then. Yes? Yes. Yes, there are links to download um, and documentation from the BHAT people is actually pretty good. Uh, I, I only showed you some really basic scenarios, but something else you can do is you can put in like a matrix, a table, and it can go through the whole table and fill those in into your variables. Um, another thing for us, um, our, our demo site is called Earth Institute, um, and it's a live site that we demo to clients, and we, um, so it, it's constantly changing. Like, the number of inspections on that site you know, is growing. So how do I do a test suite if I don't know what my data is? That makes it hard, not a problem. First of all, we copied it over to another server. But um, we can um, do a setup scenario, like prerequisites. So I'm going to pull, um, create this user. I'm gonna make sure they have these roles. I'm gonna have them create some content that's you know, owned by them and then I'm going to log out, and I'm gonna do that again, and then I'm gonna log in as a third person and go interact with that new stuff. And then you can clean it all up afterwards if you want to. Does it integrate with water? I have not heard that it does. However, water scripts are like Selenium scripts, right? Um, I've never even looked at a water script to see what it looks like. My assumption, is you could have water, I don't know, Dan, answer the question. Okay, um, so with here are water scripts, uh, I would have said, um, you can use to do some automated testing and things like that. Uh, in fact, we do very minor automated testing with that. Uh, primarily we use them for uh, configuration and for rollouts of patches and new releases. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily integrate uh, per se. There are two separate things that you can used to do similar objectives. Um, I've never seen any integration, however there may be some. Can you have the water script say, run this command and it kick off the, the BHAT tests? Uh, if you have your BHAT tests that you can run from a web server, mm -hmm. if you can trigger them from a web server, yes, you can do that. Okay. Um, and you can probably also trigger which tier scripts if you have them set up that way, but which tier scripts just run the Thanks, Dan. Yes? You said you can check against a user role um, in your BHAT test, and yet it's still platform agnostic. So how is it checking against data about that? So the tests that you are writing might be very specific to your website, but they don't have to be. Okay. So that's your choice. Um, if we were to you know, write all these tests and then switch it to another, another platform, some of the stuff's gonna have to change because it's hard not to be specific to your platform. However, if my front end test says, you know, when I upload a photo, I should see it in the left sidebar or whatever, and that maybe hasn't actually changed, it's just a back end kind of interpretation code that needs to figure out what does that mean for this platform. Okay, so your class is still interacting with whatever platform you're using? Yes. And it's just PHP. So, I mean, you, anything you could write in PHP, you can write there. Is that it, guys? Cool, thanks. <laughs>